On January 14, 1968, the Oakland Raiders met the Green Bay Packers in Miami's famous Orange Bowl to determine the world champion of professional football. Call it loud and clear while it's in the air. I'm going to let it hit the ground. It is tails. And Oakland has won the ball. We'll see. They want the football. We will defend this goal here. Okay. They may take quite a bit of time in the huddle. I would figure these are devious pass routes on a third and 16 situation. The game's television audience totaled over 70 million viewers. More than one third of the entire population of the United States. Right from the beginning of the game, there was a sense of superior Packer power, grown strong but not fat on history. The first time Green Bay got the ball, quarterback Bart Starr directed them to the Oakland 32-yard line. Don Chandler kicked a 39-yard field goal to give the Packers a 3-0 lead. Near the end of the first period, Starr began another march into Oakland territory. The longest gains in this drive were a 17-yard pass to split end Carroll Dale and a 14-yard run by Starr himself. Let's work out there. Let's work out there. At the outset of the second quarter, Chandler kicked another field goal. This one from the 20, and Green Bay moved ahead six to nothing. Hey, anytime you have a tight 40 L, and anytime they come in with a tight U, you have to get a call back on the weak side. Throughout the season, Oakland's defensive line, led by Big Ben Davidson, had consistently put pressure on opposing passers. Confident of this rush from the front four, Oakland's cornerbacks developed the habit of playing pass receivers extremely tight to cut off the short pass, assuming that there wouldn't be a long one. This tactic cost them a touchdown in the middle of the second quarter when Starr on first down found Boyd Dowler deep down the middle for a 62-yard touchdown. The scoring pattern, Dowler explains, was a basic one. Quick post is what it amounts to, but uh, just he and I out there, uh, man on man, and I kind of horse by him. I bumped him when I came off the line of scrimmage, and he bumped me. We bumped each other, I guess. You put it that way. The Raiders were behind 13 to nothing. But if they were impressed, they did not act it. Daryl LaMonica, their young quarterback, went to work with poise and efficiency. He ran Hewitt Dixon and Pete Banaszak into the line, and for the first time in the game, they made good yardage. LaMonica then switched to his passing game and moved the Raiders to the Packer 23 with two well-directed throws. Monica wound up the drive by passing to end Bill Miller for a touchdown. The strategy which resulted in Oakland's first score is worth reviewing. The touchdown play came out of a double wing formation that was designed to flood the left side of Green Bay's secondary with three potential pass receivers. One of them, Bill Miller, found an open spot just beyond linebacker Dave Robinson. Miller pulled in LaMonica's perfectly thrown pass and beat safety man Tom Brown to the end zone. Miller's touchdown cut the Packer lead to six points. And at this juncture in the game, 
the Raiders gain the momentum. Gonna rush in there now. Oakland's defense broke down Green Bay's blocking and forced the Packers to punt from deep in their own territory. But Oakland was denied an excellent scoring opportunity when Roger Bird fumbled Donny Anderson's short punt and the Packers recovered. The Raiders had made their first serious error and it turned out to be a costly one. Starr immediately moved Green Bay into field goal range with a short completion to Dowler. With six seconds left in the half, Don Chandler kicked a 43-yard field goal. Chandler's kick did more than make the score 16 to 7 at halftime. It gave Green Bay an edge they never lost. In fact, Packer co-captain Willie Davis felt that this could have been the game's turning point. Specific turning point. I thought maybe when we got the field goal right before the half, uh, instead of them having the ball at midfield, maybe and trying a field goal, we had it and got a field goal and put a 16 to 7. And I think this made a big difference because it's, they possibly could have completed a ball and got a maybe a field goal and would have tightened the score. In the third period. Green Bay pried apart Oakland's defenses and assumed complete control of the game. Ben Wilson and Donnie Anderson moved confidently through the Raiders for steady gains. Let's run it down that throat now. But it was Bart Starr's passing and as important, his selection of passes that made the difference. Starr provided the game clincher on a call that is, for him, standard operating procedure. It was third and one on the Green Bay 40. Starr faked the line plunge, then lofted the ball to elderly Max McGee. Starr has used this play successfully many times in the NFL, and according to Oakland safety man Howie Williams, the Raiders were aware of it. Uh, we knew the play was coming, and uh, we'd set up an arrangement whereby we were going to jam McGee in and not let him out. But uh, as it turned out, McGee slipped through. Twelve-year veteran Max McGee demonstrated the value of experience when he outfoxed three Oakland defenders and caught the ball for a 35-yard gain. Donnie Anderson caught a shorter pass and brought Green Bay to the Oakland one. Two plays later, Anderson cantered into the end zone for Green Bay's second touchdown. Anderson's run made it 23 to 7. And at that moment, everyone understood that the outcome for all purposes had been determined and Green Bay would be champion again. Well, I think very definitely they put the frosting on the cake. Uh, at that time, we, we did have a lead, but uh, uh, instead of having maybe just a, a shaky lead, all at once we had a good, secure lead. And I think that, uh, uh, as far as I'm concerned, I, I, this was the first time I really felt that maybe things were on easy street. Welcome back to Film Session on the NFL Network. For the second straight year, the Super Bowl gave the people of Green Bay, Wisconsin, reason to be proud. For it proved that their Packers were the best team in all of football. For Oakland Raider fans, the game was like watching a man on the side of a hill trying to hold back a huge boulder. Eventually, it was bound to start rolling. But there were times when the Raiders seemed to be saying that if it did, it would not roll on this day. Several times during the first three quarters, Oakland's defense shut down Packer marches deep in Raider territory. They obliterated Green Bay's running game and twice forced the Packers to settle for field goals. Tom Keating, 
Oakland's aggressive young tackle, bucked and slugged in the trenches with Green Bay's Gail Gellingham and Ken Bowman, and once boiled through to come down with Star on his lap. Of Oakland's front four, Keating was the one who caused the most trouble for the Packers. But the one most noticeable from the stands was six foot seven inch Ben Davidson, number 83. In 1967, Davidson was named to the all AFL team and his reputation for fury was well documented in this championship game. Offense, Oakland was not as impressive, although there were several outstanding individual performances. Eura Dixon, the Raiders' big fullback, was the team's leading ground gainer. In the third period, his bludgeoning legs accounted for all of Oakland's yardage. Dixon gained not only 52 yards rushing, but also the respect of Henry Jordan, Green Bay's veteran tackle. Well, he's one of the hardest runners we've met. I won't say he is the hardest because it's hard to compare, but he was doing some real good running out there. In fact, he did uh, a lot just on his own, you know, with no blocking. In Oakland's offensive line, the most noteworthy performance was turned in by a rookie guard, Gene Upshaw, number 63. Upshaw blocked superbly all day, and not once did he permit Henry Jordan, number 74, to get to the passer. The Raiders, as they clearly demonstrated in this game, have the enthusiasm, muscle, and size to become a truly superior football team. All they lacked, and it was a noticeable lack on this Sunday, was the Packer experience. The Raiders are a young team, and their greenish hue became very apparent in the harsh light of a championship game. Oakland fumbled three times and suffered one interception. Green Bay capitalized on nearly every mistake and won the game with professional efficiency. At the heart of Green Bay's precision attack was quarterback Bart Starr. Poised in the face of Oakland's furious rush, Starr picked his plays well with his usual self-assurance and almost instant recognition of defenses. When the Raiders blitzed, Starr usually caught the minute and pitched short passes over the middle to tight end Marv Fleming. But more often than not, he handed the ball to fullback Ben Wilson, who responded by gaining 65 yards. Wilson wasn't supposed to start, but he did, and emerged as the game's leading ball carrier. Wilson also provided the only suspense the game produced when he spent the fourth quarter on the sidelines searching for a lost contact lens. I'll be a son of a gun. Although Green Bay's steady ball control offense was effective, it was the defense which established the dominance of the Packers over the Raiders. It was written before this game that the Packers live by their defense. On this Sunday, the Raiders may have died by it. Willie Davis is 32 years old, and he is, in a sense, the guts of the tough Green Bay defense. He is listed in the Packer roster as weighing 245 pounds, but he charges as if he weighed twice that much.
Davis made seven unassisted tackles. A performance that will not be forgotten by young Harry Shue, the Raider who played opposite him. The greatest that I have come against. He taught me a few lessons today that uh, I won't forget. Davis explains that Green Bay's defensive strategy was to stop Oakland's outside running. The running outside had been their strongest suit. And I think this was the thing that we had to do early in the ball game was cut off the outside run, which we were able to do. And uh, I think this made a difference. In the meantime, our offense got some points on the board, and of course, uh, they were in a different situation. Green Bay's defense is based on the biggest and best set of linebackers in football. At one corner is Leroy Caffey, number 60, mean and expert after five years of consistent play in the NFL. At the other corner, is number 89, all pro Dave Robinson, whose credentials include speed, balance, and 250 pounds. At 31 years of age, middle linebacker Ray Nitschke has lost most of his hair, but he still plays, as he puts it, with reckless abandon. On the game's first play, he flipped Hewitt Dixon heels over helmet for no gain. When the Raiders tried to run wide, Nitschke shot through the gaps left by Oakland's pulling guards to run down Raider ball carriers from behind. Time after time, Nitschke, Robinson and Caffey demonstrated their remarkable talent for lateral pursuit. Dixon and Banazak were unable to turn up field as Oakland's powerful wide running attack was completely nullified by Green Bay's mobile linebackers. Green Bay's exacting secondary proved just as effective against Oakland's passing game. Through three quarters of play, they permitted the Raiders only seven pass completions. Cornerback Herb Adderley intimidated Oakland's receivers with his savage tackling. And in the third quarter, he drove down the last firm nail in the Raider coffin when he intercepted a pass and raced 60 yards to the Packers' final touchdown. Adderley's interception was the result of his ability to anticipate LaMonica's delivery, and his touchdown was the result of a shattering block thrown by number 77, Ron Kostelnik. Adderley's score, coupled with Don Chandler's fourth field goal, gave the Packers a 33-7 lead. Oakland's Bill Miller pulled in the final touchdown of the day, but all it did was make the game closer on the records than it had been on the field. The game and the world title belong to the Packers of Green Bay. Now, back to more film session on the NFL Network. In the final analysis, the 1968 World Championship game will not be remembered for what happened on the field. It will not be remembered for its spectacular plays, its strategy, or its violence. It will be remembered as the end of an era in professional football. For on this day, Vince Lombardi earned his final victory. One month after the game, he announced his retirement and thus brought to an end the most dynamic coaching career in pro history. During Lombardi's nine-year tenure as head coach at Green Bay, the Packers won five world championships. But he was more than just a coach to the men who played for him, men like Jerry Kramer. He had to be. He's been such a dominant force in our life for the last ten years, you know. Uh, he's been the only reason for our great success at Green Bay. I believe that, and I'm sure everyone else believes it. It's inconceivable to think that anyone would know that that was Coach Lombardi's last game and just let it go as another game. I'm sure that was on everyone's mind and they wanted to do the best thing they could and play the game as well as possible for him. 
And so, on this, Vince Lombardi's final afternoon as coach, the Packers were motivated by something far stronger than pride or prestige or money. The real turning point of this championship game did not occur on the field. It was not the result of a good kick, a fine run, a hard tackle, or an accurate pass. It occurred in the locker room at halftime, and it was the result of a few words. We had all been pretty aware of the fact that Coach Lombardi was thinking very, very seriously about retirement. And uh, while many of us cuss him or call him names or a number of things, it's something like you might do with your family. You can call your brother something, but don't let anybody else call him the same thing. This is the same way with Mr. Lombardi. We can cuss him, but don't let anybody else holler at him. Uh, and we all felt that this was going to be his last game. And uh, I'm, I said to the fellows, I said, look, we got 30 more minutes this year. I said, let's give it to the old man. Let's play the last 30 for the old man. That's about all I said. At 6.06 Eastern Standard Time, Vince Lombardi was carried off the field for the last time. He was carried not just to the locker room, but a few steps closer to the Hall of Fame.